All right, we'll start out with the easiest uh, pro algebraic properties of exponents and then work into the more difficult ones. So <clears throat> if you're not sure about some of the rules, I'll show you an easy way to figure out a few of them. So the first rule we'll look at, a to the c times a to the b. Most of us know this is a to the c plus b. So there's the first rule of exponents. We can do a really fast example. If you're not sure, maybe I should be multiplying c and b instead of adding them. All you have to do is think about an example. We'll just do 3 squared times 3 cubed. And the question is, should this be 3 to the fifth or 3 to the sixth? So an easy way to figure this out, just think of uh, this is 3 times 3. That's 3 squared. And 3 cubed, 3 times 3 times 3. And it should be pretty clear that's 3 to the fifth not 3 to the 6. So you can always do a really fast example to convince yourself uh, of what the rule should be. And now we'll look at a to the b to the c power. That is, what do you do with powers of powers? This is a to what power? b times c. So powers of powers become products. And if you want to see the example for this, you can make up any examples you want. Uh, just make sure your powers aren't one, or that's not very exciting, because first power, there's not much going on. And I'll just go 3 squared cubed, I think will be. The reason why 3 squared squared is bad, because 2 plus 2 is 4, and 2 times 2 is 4. That's why I'm not using all exponents of 2. So. This is 3 times 3, 3 times 3, and another 3 times 3. That's Each of those is 3 squared, and there's 3 of them, so that is 3 to the 6th power. You can see all 6 3's. And of course, before that was 3 to the 5th power. All right, so powers of powers are products, so that's our second rule right there. Uh, let's go with negative powers. What is a to the negative b if I want to rewrite it without a negative power? So it's 1 over a to the b. So negatives are reciprocals. I think in your book they do a special case for negative first power, which is 1 over a. But if you look at the previous one, it, you just use the first power right there. So. You don't really need that last one because it derives right off the uh, negative power right above it. So these are our basic rules right here for logs or for exponentials. So there should be a review. And now what we're going to do is look at uh, good bases and bad bases. I'm generally going to use letter A for bases just to keep it consistent with the rest of the notes. So good bases come from two intervals, either between 0 and 1, or anything bigger than 1. So I will talk about why 1 is a bad base, why 0 is a bad base, and all the negatives are bad bases. Uh, this is the first interval right here is what I, what I call small bases. And then if you're bigger than 1, I call that big bases. They act very differently. We'll see when we graph that small bases graph completely differently than the big ones. So if you're less than 1, it's going to act a lot differently than being greater than 1. All right, so <coughs> those are good bases. So why are the other values bad? All right, so why are they not good? Let's start with the worst, which are negatives. So the easiest negative number I can think of is negative 1. All right, so we're going to look at negative 1, why that's not a good base. What is negative 1 to the 1 half power? I. So that's i. So as soon as you start using negative bases, you're getting into complex territory. So 
So we get complex numbers. <coughs> now there is a whole entire subject called complex analysis that analyzes complex numbers. And you wouldn't get to that until graduate school, so we're going to skip over negative bases. So negative bases are bad. What about zero? So why is zero bad? Uh, what is zero raised to any power? Zero. <coughs> so that's not very exciting. So that's every single. Ah, well, there is, there is a bad power to raise zero to. What's zero to the negative first? So we'll look up the rules. It says reciprocal. We just all nodded on that. Agreed. Well, that's undefined. So it's either boring or undefined. It's either always zero or undefined. So that's not very helpful. So that's why zero is a bad base. And now the one number that we removed from good bases, if you look, we used all positive numbers except one. So why do we skip over one? One is not the worst base, but it is boring. <coughs> All right, so what is one to any power? One. One, so it suffers from the same boring problem zero does. It's a little better. What's one to the negative one? One. One over one, which is one. At least it doesn't go undefined, but it's very boring. All right, so these are the reasons we don't consider negative 0 or 1 as a base, because it's either uh, complex or incredibly boring. So when using good bases, uh, we have the property that if a to the b equals a to the c, then I can say that b equals c. So if I'm using good bases, positive and not 1, and I know that a to the b equals a to the c, then I can say that the two powers are equal. That's the only way to get equality when using a good base. So the type of example problem I can give Solve for x. All right, we're going to use a theorem right above. That theorem says if I can write both sides in the same base, then the exponents are equal. Can you rewrite 81 as 3 raised to a power? So 3 raised to what power is 81? So 9 times 9 is 81. So I could go 3 squared squared, or I could just say 3 to the fourth. So I just rewrote 81 as 3 to the fourth power. And these bases are now the same. They're both good. So that means the powers have to be equal. So x has to equal 4. Now, if we have 1 to the 4th equals 1 to the x, x can be anything it wants. And that's always true. So we just said x, uh, 1 to any power is 1. So this doesn't mean x equals 4. It means x can equal anything right here. So all real numbers are the solution to this. You don't get that nice uh, x has to equal 4 property, because the bases are both 1. All right, so you cannot apply that theorem that I wrote at the top of the board there. All right, so that is about good bases and bad bases. I'm going to rewrite this property that I just wrote down, put it in a box, and then I'll rewrite it next to it on the right side.
So I'm going to create this function f of x. It's going to be kind of boring. It's just a to the x. I'm going to rewrite this theorem over here. It's a to the b equals a to the c. So that means f of b equals f of c. So I'm just rewriting them in function notation. So I'm not doing anything fancy other than rewriting a to the b. Of course, what is f of b? You just look up to the function right above. You plug in b wherever you see x. So f of b is a to the b power. So that statement says, if f of b equals f of a, then b equals c. You do have to go back two chapters. What did we just, what is this equivalent to? You've seen this before. This is a test for something. We just did. So this is a horizontal line test. And what does a horizontal line test detect? One to one. So this is uh, one to one. So this theorem right here uses the assumption that the function is one, exponential function is one to one. When we graph it, we'll see that it is one to one. It'll be increasing or decreasing the entire time. So <clears throat> this property right here just comes from the fact that exponential functions are one to one when you have a good base. So this leads into the graph. So we're going to start with graphing. I'm only going to graph two bases. I'll graph one good base and one bad base. Or one good, well, both will be good bases, but we'll do one big base and one small base. And I'm going to use 2 as our uh, big base. I could use any number bigger than 1, but I think using not uh, avoiding integers is a bad idea. So we'll just go with 2. So we're going to graph f of x equals 2 to the x. How do you start a graph when you really don't know very much about the function? So how do we graph when we don't know what's going on? Clueless method. Clueless method, very good. So we're going to make a table of values. Now we think about domain. Is there any x value such that you couldn't take 2 to that power? So think about the positive numbers. Even decimals and fractions, you can still get all positive powers. 0 is fine, 2 to the 0 is 1. So 0 is fine. Negative numbers, we just said they're reciprocals. So they're going to be OK, too. So we can use all positives, 0, and negatives. So there is uh, no bad uh, values in the domain. So we'll just go with the standard 0, 1, and 2, and negative 1, and negative 2. So we get our five points right here. Go ahead and graph them out. You won't have any negative y values, so you can draw your x-axis pretty low. You definitely have negative x values. So I used, on my graph, I just used two blocks as one unit. 
So there's my five points. All right, we can connect them with a the curve. Just go from the first to the last. Don't try to draw the arrows going off yet. So just connect these with a the smooth curve. Yep. Two to the zero is one. Uh, so I didn't talk about that property up here. I probably should add that in. So a to the zero is defined to be one uh, because it makes all the other rules work out, basically. So if we think about a to the zero using these other properties, uh, let's look at y. Looks like a six. Why is a to the zero equal to one? Well, according to the rules, I could write this as a times a to the negative one because one plus negative one is zero. So that's using the uh, that first property up there. Uh, and I could write this as a times one over a. And what does this equal just from our knowledge of uh, arithmetic. That equals 1. So to be consistent with our other rules, a to the 0 has to equal 1, or else what I just wrote down would be false. So if, if for example, if a to the 1 equaled a, then this would, that at the end would turn into a, which is not correct. So it's, kind of, it's, it's what it has to be for all the rules to work, be consistent and work out. It's a little weird to think about because if you think about exponents, this means a multiplied by itself no times. So it's kind of vacuously one, not one for any reason other than it makes the rest of the rules work out. It's pretty redundant. Yeah, if you choose anything else other than one, you will get to, uh, if you combine a couple of the rules like we did, you'll get problems that uh, the other rules will start breaking down. All right. <clears throat> so I'll connect these together with the curve, and then we're going to think about end behavior. So it should be cle pretty clear what's happening on the right end. So if I went to 3, I would get 2 cubed, which is 8. So the further to the right I go, I go up higher and higher. So the right end behavior is up to the right. So it acts a lot like a polynomial. It looks a lot like a parabola, whereas you keep going to the right and it keeps going up. It does go up faster than a parabola, but until we get to calculus class, we can't properly compare to these. So for our purposes, it looks a lot like a parabola on that side. What happens if I keep going to the left? If I used negative 3, I would get a positive y value, but it would be even smaller. It would be 1 eighth. That's right. So we get close to 0. And we can draw that in like this. Now, when we do get closer and closer to 0, that's a horizontal asymptote. So we'll draw that in. So I'm going to use orange for my y equals 0 horizontal asymptote. So this has some weird end behavior. So on the right side, we're going to go up. On the left side, we have y equals 0. So this is different than rational functions and polynomials, because in polynomials or rational functions, if you were horizontal asymptote on one side, you were horizontal asymptote on both sides. And if you were up or down on one side, you would be up or down on the other side. This is the first mixed pair that we have. All right, so there's our end behavior for a bigger base. This function right here is pretty clearly increasing. So it's 1 to 1. If you picked any y value on the graph, it comes from 1x value, with the exception of you can't have y values of 0 or negative. So we'll write the domain and the range down for this function. The domain is everything. 
the range is definitely not everything. So the range goes from 0 to infinity. Do we ever hit 0? No. We never hit 0. We got close. We keep going to the left. We get close, but we'll never actually hit 0. So we have open at 0. So there was our big base example. We'll do our next example graph on small base. So I'm choosing a small base. The easiest one I could think of is 1 half. It's the easiest number between 0 and 1. There's other good numbers. A third's pretty good. But I'm just going to go with a 1 half. So we can go, go the clueless method, absolutely, and plot some points that way, graph them. What I'm going to do instead is some algebra. So those properties we listed above, I could rewrite this as 2 to the negative first power to the x power. So we know 1 half is the same as 2 to the negative first. And what can I do with these two powers, negative 1 and x? So I don't add them, but I multiply them. So powers of powers are products. So this is 2 to the negative 1 x, or just 2 to the negative x. So a little bit of algebra turns this function into something similar to what we just graphed. So our original f of x was 2 to the x. What is the difference between? f of x and g of x. What transformation do I apply to f to get g? Alright, so we'll write down f of x is 2 to the x and g of x equals 2 to the negative x. So what's the difference? Raised it to the negative 1. So we modified our exponent. So x became negative x. What horizontal transformation is that? We've even written it as 2 to the negative 1 times x. Am I adding or multiplying? Multiplying. Multiplying. Is it a horizontal or a vertical? It's happening to x. So it's horizontal. So is it a horizontal shift or stretch? It's going to be a stretch, and it's going to be a reflection across the y-axis. So it's not getting bigger or smaller. It's just going to reflect. So g is the graph of f reflected across the y-axis. And you can see it. It is f of neg g of x is f of negative x. You just take out x and put a negative x. And that's your g function. All right, so all we have to do is take that graph of f and reflect it across the y-axis. So we got the graph of f right there. Pretty easy to reflect across the y-axis. So go ahead and redraw that graph. The one point that does not move is the y-intercept at 1. It's going to stay where it is.
And we have still our horizontal asymptote, y equals 0, except it's on the right side because we reflected. So ready for the end behavior. So y equals 0 on the right side and up on the left side. And we can write domain and range. So we have the same domain, the same range. So we'll do one example where I intentionally put some transformations in, and then I want you to grab that function. So I will use base 2. So this transformations and graph. All right, so there's a lot of transformations going on in this form. You can always do algebra whenever you want to. So I could leave this 2x minus 1 the way it is. I can also write 4 is 2 squared. What can I do with the two exponents right here? Add them together. So I get 2x plus 1 now. It was 2x minus 1 plus 2 more. So that eliminated one of the transformations that eliminated our vertical stretch of 4 and turned it into a horizontal shift. That should seem really strange. So some shapes of graphs, one transformation can turn into the exact same effect as a different transformation. So here's where a vertical stretch of 4 was the same as a shift to the right. Um, well, it's a little hard to see his shift to the right. All right. <clears throat> We're about to graph this, but first, I taught you to factor that 2 out in the order that we graphed. So what number goes right here? Is it one half or half? So that'll be 1 half. All right, <clears throat> so we have our base function. y equals 2 to the x. We're going to do our horizontal transformations first. They're all listed right there near the x, so I'm looking inside the exponent. So we're going to do our stretch. So we're going to stretch by, how much do I stretch by? I'm looking at the number 2. It looks like I should multiply by 2. But I should multiply by a half. So we're going to multiply by a half. All right, so that takes care of our stretch. Now we're going to do our uh, shift plus 1 half. Is that left or right 1 half? So it looks like we should go positive, but all horizontals are opposite. So we're going to go left 1 half. All right, that takes care of horizontals. What is the one vertical? 
our one vertical transformation. Vertical shift. So we got a shift. That plus two is that up or down? So we're going to go up two. All right, so our base function, let's start with that graph. Isn't the horizontal shift, is it, is it also the reciprocal? Or is it just? Shift. Yeah. So, it's the, so it looks like we should go right one half. Oh, never mind. I was looking at vertical. So it is the opposite. We're going left one half. Okay. All right, so our base function had 0, 1, 1, 2. Those are the three x values I'm, or uh, points I'm going to use. I'll write down their coordinates, connect them with that curve. Right there, of course, we have y equals 0. So apply all three transformations. Do one at a time, stretch, shift, and then shift. You don't have to redraw the coordinates of the points um, if you don't if you feel like you don't need to. You will gonna ha you are gonna have fractional values for sure. Lots of halves. Just think when you're shifting up, you're adding 2 to your y value in this case. Okay. So that includes y equals 0, it becomes y equals 2.
for your end behavior because <clears throat> y equals zero happens on only one side. You don't need to necessarily draw the full horizontal asymptote because it's really a one-sided horizontal asymptote that only really happens with exponential functions. So you don't need to draw out the full asymptote on both sides. So exponential functions have an asymptote, a one-sided asymptote. All right, so there is our graph with all transformations built in with it. So any questions on the different steps for the uh, graphs to get there? So it's good to refresh things in your mind so you don't forget transformations. They do not stop existing just because we're not in the transformation section anymore. Sure. So let's look at some more algebraic examples using more of the algebra rules. And on these, we're all going to be uh, just solving. to what power is equal to 2? So the property we're going to use, a to the b, if a to the b equals a to the c, then b equals c, as long as you have a good base. Can't we incorporate logs into this too? No. No, we can't? Not yet. Okay. We'll do logs when we do logs. Okay. But for right now, there are no logs. All right, so what I need to do is either write 2 as 16 to a power, or I need to write 16 as 2 to a power. I think it's easier to write 16 as 2 to a power. So 2 to what power is 16? 2 to the fourth. So 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 is 16. Of course, it's still raised to the x power equals 2. All right, so I got the same base, but I need to have it written as with a single exponent. So 4 times x is 4x. On the right side, if I write a power up here, what power is 2 raised to? So I could write first power. That doesn't change anything. So now I finally have bases match. That means powers have to match. So then I'm using that theorem up there in the right corner. 4x equals 1, so x equals 1 fourth. So that's the exponent. All right, next example has base 27 and base 9. So I can't really write 27 as 9 to a power very easily. I can if I'm uh, very careful about it. But 9 squared is not 27. Is there a common base that I can use here? Ah, I like it. Let's go with 3. 3 is a good base. 3 to what power is 27? So 3 cubed. And 9 is 3 squared. So now I'm going to multiply my exponents, because we've got powers of powers. And we'll distribute on both sides. So we have 3 to the 6x minus 3 
equals 3 to the fourth power. So I want you to finish this problem, match up the exponents. The exponents have to be equal now. So we got 6x minus 3 equals 4, and then solve for x. And it should be an easy algebra problem now. Questions on seven sixth as X. All right, let's get a little crazier. I'm trying to keep the bases easy with either twos or threes. All right, <clears throat> see what you can do on this problem. What is the common base in this one? Two. The so common base will be two. So step one is write everything with a base two. We got a slight problem on the left side. So before I, we have two bases on the left side. But before I combine them together, I need to multiply so we get 2 times 2 to the 2x squared equals 2 to the negative 2. So this is 2 to the first power. So now you can match exponents. So the exponents have to be equal, and then see if you get a solution after that. So what would you say about this solution? So we got no real solution. So that means no solution. Uh, if I pick my example more carefully and chose a positive power on the right side, I would have had a real solution two real solutions actually. All right, so th that is exponentials. In a nutshell, we'll do logarithms tomorrow, which are the inverse of exponential functions.